Heavenly Father, we ask once again that you would be with us as we take up the study and look at some of the, the things we've been grappling with for the past several days. We ask that you would let what we discuss be easy to understand and that we would fully understand the implications of these things, uh, both as a movement and individually. Please grant us your Holy Spirit and pour out the latter rain at this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm on page 9 of the notes, and I, I didn't know how far I would get through these notes, um, but I knew these first, the first things that we covered I needed to put in place in order to put, put the logic in place. In the center on page 9, you have 777, and what that means is, is this up here. Um, this history here that Stephen has dealt with, this 777, but this history here in particular from November 9th to December 25th, which has been the focus of the studies the last few weeks, not the focus, but it's been part of the studies the last few weeks. Um, this history is, is one of the things that, that have been put in place along with the 1533, and I don't think we, the 1533 is probably on the other side of this board, so, it's unfortunate when you're doing something like I'm doing right now, that anyone that would watch this presentation, here's the 777 over here as well, but hasn't watched the earlier presentations, they're not going to know the significance of these things. But here's the 1533 that I'm speaking about, and the 1533... It's in your notes because I'm referencing that we have studied it over the past couple of weeks. 1533 B.C. is the first Passover when they were coming out of Egypt. Um, 1500 and... I don't see it here. 1533 days between August 11th, 1840 and October 22nd, 1844. Um, it's up here. Show it to me. Okay, it's it's written out. I was looking for it on a graph right here. It's 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 written out. Um, so 1533 becomes a symbol of the glorious manifestation of the power of God, because Sister White says in Great Controversy 611 that the Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God, and we know, although she doesn't specifically say it that that manifestation of the power of God began on August 11th uh, with Josiah Litch's prediction about August 11th. So when you have 1,533 days um, between August 11th, 1840 and the 22nd of October, 1844, then 1,533 becomes a symbol of the glorious manifestation of the power of God. And in Stephen's study on November 9th, where he... No, that's a different study. Yeah, this here. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting to that one. In Stephen's study um, on November 9th, 1849, and November 9th, 2019, he begins on October 22nd, 1844, and he uses the, what the literal days um, represent in the time that Christ was in the holy place, and he, he derives this, this ratio. And in that study, which... We put in the public record more than once now. Um, part of it was is that one day equated to 1,844 days, 21 hours, 15 minutes, and 33 seconds. So you can see this 1,533 in that breakdown of one day. There was 359 days from when Christ began His work in the holy place in AD 31. 359 days that equaled... 1844 days, 21 hours, 15 minutes, and 33 seconds that brought us to October 22nd, 1844. Allowed, allows you to equate um, November 9th, 1849, and November 9th, 2019. But also it, it connects with Mark 1533. And in Mark 1533, um, I'm making the assumption that and I know it's a wrong assumption. I'm not really making the assumption. I'm pretending 
that this assumption is valid. I'm making the assumption that the only people that are watching what we're putting out on the web right now are people that are still interested in what we're putting out on the web right now. But I regularly hear about the enemies of this message commenting on what we're putting out on the web right now. So I know it's not simply the people that are sympathetic to what we're teaching. But if you're sympathetic to it, then you should have already studied this. Okay, but... So 1533 is the amount of days from August 11th, 1840 to 22 October, 1844. It's also part of the ratio. Is that the right way to say it? Ratio of one day um, in a prophetic year that began at, at um, when Christ began his holy place ministry in 8031 until October 22nd. But this ratio that, that it produces one day, 1,844 days, 21 hours, has also 15 minutes and 33 seconds, and it takes you to Mark 15.33. But um, I want to begin verse 25, just to make a point, and I'm, I'm going to just read verse 25 and then verse 33. It says, And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Then verse 33, And when the sixth hour was come, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, it's in Mark 15.33 that you see the sixth and the ninth hour. Okay, so what I'm getting at now um, is that I can use this here um, as a point of reference. Here, he's doing, Stephen laid this out and he's teaching something different here. But here on July 18th, 2020, and December 25th, 2021, what we're looking at based upon Matthew 20 is <clears throat> over here at 9-11 and over here in 1989 at the time of the end. I'm saying that this is the morning of Matthew 20. This is the third hour. And then this here would be the sixth hour. And this would be the ninth hour. Immediately thereafter, or almost simultaneously, you'd have the eleventh hour in agreement with the parable of Matthew 20. The point I'm making here is that from the sixth to the ninth hour is a symbol of 1533. You follow me? It's in Mark 15.33. And if it's a symbol of 15.33, then you have 15.33 is the days between August 11th, 1840 and the 22nd of October, 1844. That's how many days there really are. Therefore, this history from the 6th hour to the ninth hour, from the beginning of Paneum to the end of Paneum, is a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And this is where the midnight cry on the big line begins, and this is the Sunday law, where the loud cry begins, so to speak. So, it's in agreement with that. 1533 becomes a, a symbol of this history, and it begins at the sixth and ninth hour at one application. So, in your notes, on the middle of page eight, all I intended to do was what I just did. It just remind us of what Stephen's already put in the record about these things, just briefly, not in detail like he's done. Um, and then I have 977, Josiah. What did I want to say about Josiah? Okay, let me switch the board now. At some point in time, I'm going to have to go back and look at some things that I have mentioned over the past week or so, a couple weeks, and get more detailed about the things that I've just briefly mentioned. Uh, things have been moving rather quickly. But one of the things I want to share here It's about Josiah. And these boards, these boards. 
I'm going to have to put a hook up there for this. Um, on this line, it's nice these boards are here, that I can come up here and do this. But it's too bad I didn't have them all out, all four of them. In this, the prophecy of Josiah in Ezekiel that we've been looking at for some time. Right here on what equates to the 13th of October on the rabbinical and Gregorian calendar, which is the 15th day of the 8th month in 977. And that reference to the 15th day of the 8th month is mentioned twice, uh, being one of the pieces of evidence that 977 is a symbol of the midnight cry. The disobedient prophet comes to Jeroboam and rebukes him for the altar, the altars that he set up in Bethel and Dan. And he gives a prophecy about the coming of Josiah. And Josiah is going to come 350 years later here and begin the work of destroying the altars in fulfillment of that prophecy. He's going to begin a work of reformation. And then five years later, Josiah is going to have the Passover. And these are both part of this, this story. So, when it comes to our history, um, this 15th day of the 8th month, Theodore put in place back in 2018 that November 20... Fifth, two 2018. Now, when, when I'm saying I'm going to have to come back and revisit some things, this is one of the things. Um, this November 25th, 2018, is also the 15th day of the 8th month. And it lines up with 977, 15th day of the 8th month. So, what I understood from this is that if you go 350, not years, but days into the future, it brings you to, not necessarily November 9th, but November 10th. Two thousand nineteen, which is the day after November ninth, okay, um, and this also is the fifteenth day of the eighth month. So when these things began to come to the surface, what I understood was that on November tenth, we were going to begin the work of Josiah. Josiah meaning foundations. And my claim as a fulfillment of that is that the door closed on the priests on November 9th. I'm not sure I understand everything about what that means that the door closed on the priests. The one thing that I'm certain of is that the door closed that the foolish priests were bound off. They get bound off first, the parable says. The terrors are bound first. There was a door closed at that point in time. And the very next day, on November 10th, we began, not we began, but we're marked as fully returning to the foundations in terms of how we interpret the rules of prophetic interpretation. Okay, we're not using the the methodology that the new movement uses um, we're back to the same line upon line applications that we did through the years. Difference is in the past we weren't time setting, but the Lord's opened up these, these facts, and we're still handling those facts the same way we always applied prophecy, but we're doing it from this foundational approach. If this is true, and I believe it is, um, I don't. It would be just too strange, number one, to be a coincidence that brings us to November 9th slash 10th, 350 days later. Do you, realize, you understand what I'm doing? I'm saying that here in 977, you have a prophecy about Josiah. It gets fulfilled when Josiah begins destroying the altars 350 years later. 
And five years after that, Josiah is going to institute the Passover. You follow that logic? So I'm bringing it over to our history. It's the 15th day of the first, the 15th day of the eighth month in 2018. And Theodore, <clears throat> Theodore's made some predictions about this history in the past. He had a prediction about November 20th and November 22nd and November 25th. And they were all tied together. And he made it in 2018. He made it before Thanksgiving Day, which was November 22nd, back in 2018. But there was some, there was some mistakes along the way on that prediction, and we have since went back and looked at it, and I don't have, the, don't have a problem with it any longer. I don't accept some of the initial premises, but here's my point, is that this was the second time in this movement where we made an advanced prediction. The first time was 2014 when Parminder said there was going to be a Sunday law in 2014. And there wasn't. And, you know, Parminder was claimed that there was even to this very day. But my point is, is that his agitation over that error forced us to go back and look at it closely. And we realized that there was something that we needed to acknowledge about 2014. We need to acknowledge that 1888 should be recognized in 2014 and that October 22nd, 1844 should be acknowledged in 2014. And when you do that, then there's a great deal of light that comes from it. But the point is, it was based upon a mistake that we go back and we investigate the mistake and then we discover light. And there are way marks in Millerite history and in biblical history that are prophetic way marks that are based upon human mistakes. Okay, and it's, so I'm saying that the first one was 2014, and when we went and looked at it after the fact, there was light that came. And the same with this. When we go back to this mistake from 2018, we see that it's still valid, it has an application, and I'm saying that one of the applications is that this is the prophecy of Josiah, and in November 10th, 2019, that 350 days is done. So what would be next? Pardon me? Passover. Passover. How many days later? Five. So, this would be Sunday, the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th. The 15th would take you to Passover. Right? You guys are still with me, right? Um, and when was the 15th? Yesterday, okay? And today is the 16th. And tomorrow is the 17th. So what would the 17th be? Well, if you're going to just do it in Josiah having the Passover feast, what would they celebrate on the 17th? First fruits. If you're going to do the the life of Christ, what would happen on the 17th? 16th. The first fruits would be the 16th. Now, no, no, you're talking about not, not I'm not talking about the, the biblical 14th, 15th, and 16th. I'm talking about if Josiah's holding a Passover this year on November 15th, that would correspond to that they were supposed to have Passover on the 14th and the 15th and the 16th. I'm not using those dates, biblical dates. I'm using the dates of the here and now. So what, would, what should happen on the 17th? The first fruits? Yes, what else? Okay, the resurrection. The resurrection, correct? Okay, so I'm saying that tomorrow, that's tomorrow, Sunday... There's to be a resurrection. But it, we're, the, the natural is going to illustrate this, the symbolic. Um, so I'm not saying that... I'm not saying... That, okay, anyway, you follow what I'm saying. So, let me, let me look at this. Um, we started on November 9th 
identifying, what we identified on November 9th was that there would be a disappointment. Um, and we started with the quote about the ark, and then we went to the quote about Elijah praying seven times, and we looked at Nebuchadnezzar heating the furnace seven times, Christ resting in the tomb on the seventh day. Uh, I forget all of them that we, we looked at. Um, but let's read this one, which was from that presentation. This is Manuscript Releases, Volume 21, page 66. When the ark was finished and the goods were stored, another sign was given. Approaching the ark were seen, seven, were seen cattle and all other living creatures, two and two. And we learned today in Sabbath school, how long did it take to load the ark? Seven days. These having been housed, there came a period of testing. So there, there's going to be a period of testing. And although it takes prophetic application to make this claim, I'm going to make this claim, how long does this disappointment, this testing time, take in this, in this application? Seven days. Seven days. So the tenth would be the first day, right? The disappointment is going to be the day after number nine. Tenth. 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th. So tomorrow, today, this is the end of the disappointment. Tomorrow, what's supposed to happen? Pardon me? The flood. Okay, the flood. Yeah, there's rain coming, okay? On, on that line. You follow me? And I've seen rain coming today after... After the presentation, those of you that are watching live stream now, um, there was a flood of rain that came after the presentation when Stephen came up here and, and filled this board with stuff he's looking at. Lord willing, he's going to put it into the live stream on Monday for you. But I'm saying as of tomorrow, we should expect to see some lights come on that we haven't seen before. Why am I saying that based upon the presentation today? Can you think of one reason? Because at midnight in the 30th year, Ezekiel's taken in and he has a vision of the sanctuary. And it's all these wills within wills. And at first glance it looks confusing, but it's in perfect order. Okay, so I'm expecting now, here on this day, that there's going to be a resurrection from the dead, um, and an ascension to heaven... Did he not ascend to heaven when he was resurrected? And then what did he do after he ascended to heaven? No, 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 you guys, he did, walk through it just at the simple level. He went, to, he resurrected, he ascended to heaven, and then what did he do? No, 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 he came back down. He came back down, and he breathed upon the disciples... The Holy Spirit, okay? So, here, on this day, which would be the resurrection day, we have reason with Josiah's prophecy to think that there's going to be extra light begin to be manifested. And we have a second witness to that, I believe, that the testing of the seven days in the ark is over, and it's about to rain. And it has to do this. If we're on the right track, it has to do this. Because it's going to take some courage to actually present this message that we're already presenting. But it's not only going to take some courage, it, you're probably going to get in trouble for presenting this message. And you're going to want to know for, for certainty that you believe this message and understand this message and I think it's the Lord's responsibility to make that all happen. That's why He's going to make sure that He gets connected with those that are proclaiming this message. Next page. In this history here, if we go back here, way back here, to November 13th, 1833, and this has been 
a subject of some discussion here. I want to read this whole passage here about the falling of the stars in 1833 because I'm going to claim that here on the 13th, because of the connection here of the number... Two eighty six slash seven. Is that right? Two eighty six. Yeah, that's right. I, I have the I have the teachers and the students in the audience. Now's the time to correct me for. One eighty six. Okay. Were you going to let me go along on that one? Right. Why do I have slash seven? First off. 186 slash 7. 187 is yeah, original. Uh, no, I know, I know. I, I'm, I'm asking if they know. I know how to explain it for myself, even if I don't know the right terms. The 13th is the 187th day. So 184. Okay, close. It's 186 years. Perfect amount from the falling of the stars in 1833 to November 12th, actually, of 2019. But November 13th of 2019 is the 187th November 13th since that time. Okay, so that's why I got 186 slash 187. Slash seven is what I have up there, but wh wh what's 187? July it's July 18. Okay, so it's it's carrying this symbol of this message about July 18th, 2020. So the message about July 18th, 2020 has to do with Sister White's identifying that balls of fire were going to come down on Nashville, Tennessee. So when we began to look at this, we read a, I think it was Brother Daniel read a passage from the Great Controversy. I'm going to read a passage and, and he left part out that I, want to, that I want to include. So those of you that were in that, that study that hasn't been on the internet, make sure you follow all the way through. I want to look at the characteristics of the falling of the stars in 1833, but read a little bit further. It says, in 1833, two years after Miller began to present his pu in public the evidence of Christ's soon coming, let me tell you something here. Let me ask you something. What happened on November 13th? What happened in 1833 with William Miller? He received his credentials. Okay, from who? The churches. No. The Baptist Church. The Baptist church. What happened in 1834? He received his credentials from all the churches. So Miller first gets credentials with the Baptist Church, and then in 1834 he gets credentials from all the churches. Okay, and so what was this? This was confirmation that the Lord had chosen his messenger of that time period. Is that, is that okay to say? Yes. Okay, so cho choosing the message of that time period, what's it mean that he actually gets chosen two years in a row. A, okay, a doubling perhaps. But what, what's it mean in terms of the feast of, of God's Word? It's the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is the warning that the Day of Atonement is going to come. When did William Miller say the Day of Atonement was going to come? 1843. Ten years before 1843, he receives his credentials. But is the Lord going to actually come into the Most Holy Place in 1833, 43? No. So, in 1844, Miller's receiving his credentials from all the churches. Ten years before 1844. He's, he is the Feast of Trumpets. So, what, did the Lord make a mistake in 1833? Should the, should the stars have fallen in 1844? Because the Feast of Trumpets takes place ten days before the Day of Atonement. It was a token? That's a, that's a nice, probably true. What's interesting is if you go into the, to the Hebrew culture, whatever you would call it, when they have their Feast of Trumpets ten days before the Day of Atonement, 
You know what they did 11 days before? They bust out the trumpets and they practice on them so that they have it right for the, day, the, the, for the Feast of Trumpets. So their, their custom was sound the trumpets the day before and so you're, they're in tune and everything, I guess, if you have to tune up a, a, a ram's horn um, and you, you're going to blow it the next day. So this happened in Millerite history. This is the Feast of Trumpets. This is a warning that probation is about to close 10 years later. Okay, so not only do the stars fall, but probably more significant than the fall, stars falling was that the messenger of that period is getting his credentials by the people of that period, and God is putting his seal of approval on it. Okay, so it's primarily in the United States where this phenomenon takes place, and it's primarily in the United States where William Miller gives his message. This is an important point for my logic, because I'm going to argue that when this is repeated down here in our history, that it's not about the United States, it's not about the people of the world, it's about the priests, people that have been called to be priests, because there's only going to be basically two responses, either joy that this has happened, whatever it is in our time period, or fear that you're on the wrong side of the issue. So I'll go back and try to read through it without interrupting it. In 1833, two years after Miller began to present in public the evidences of Christ's soon coming, the last of the signs appeared which were promised by the Savior as tokens of his second advent. Said Jesus, the stars shall fall from heaven. And John in the Revelation declared as he beheld and visioned the scenes that should herald the day of God, the stars of heaven fell unto earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This prophecy received a striking and impressive fulfillment in the great meteoric, meteoric shower of November 13, 1833. That was the most extensive and wonderful display of falling stars which has ever been recorded, the whole firmament over all the United States being then for hours in fiery commotion. No celestial phenomenon has ever occurred in this country since its settlement, which was viewed with such intense admiration by one class in the community or with so much dread and alarm by another. Its sublimity and awful beauty still linger in many minds. Never did rain fall much thicker than the meteors fell toward the earth. East, west, north, and south, it was the same. In a word, the whole heaven seemed in motion. This display, as described in Professor Silliman's journal, was seen all over North America. From two o'clock until broad daylight, the sky being filled perfectly the sky being perfectly serene and cloudless and an incessant play of dazzling, brilliant luminosities was kept up in the whole heavens. I'm going to pass over some more comment in the next paragraph. Go to the next paragraph. In the New York Journal of Commerce of November 14, 1833, appeared a long article regarding this wonderful phenomenon containing this statement. No philosopher or scholar has told or recorded an event, I suppose, like that of yesterday morning. A prophet 1,800 years ago foretold it exactly, if we will be at the trouble of understanding stars falling to mean falling stars, in the only sense in which it possibly to be literally true. Thus was displayed the last of those signs of his coming, concerning which Jesus bade his disciples, when all these things, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is, is near, even at the door. After these signs, John beheld as the great event next impending, the heavens departing as a scroll, while the earth quaked, mountains and islands removed out of their places, and the wicked in terror sought to flee from the presence of the Son of Man. Many who witnessed the falling of the stars looked upon it as the herald of the coming judgment, an awful type, a sure forerunner, a merciful sign of that great and dreadful day. Thus, the attention of the people was directed to the fulfillment of prophecy, and many were led, led to give heed to the warning of the second advent. Notice the next sentence. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the second advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Do you see it? That this was the sign that preceded the message of Josiah Litch. 
And the message of Josiah Litch in our day and age is the message that was put in place back here two years before the event in 2017 on November 4th. Josiah Litch was predicting... Two years before, Josiah Litch is making a prediction about Islam, and two years before, we're making a prediction about Islam down here. And before this, Sister White doesn't jump into 1838, she jumps into 1840, and then she talks about 1838. But before he gets to 1840, he's going to fine-tune it. We're in the time period of the fine-tuning. From, from this day onward is the fine-tuning of this coming message. And on November 13th, just a couple of days ago, on November 12th, we were in this room saying... We should expect a token. What's the token going to be? Uh, and I won't remember one sister, and she wasn't being sarcastic, and she wasn't being negative. When the subject come up, well, if nothing comes to pass, what are we going to do? And she said, we go back to the drawing board. And she wasn't being, she wasn't undermining any, any thoughts. She was just being, well, that's what we're going to have to do. And before the 13th, I began to think of some things. And what I begin to think of, I will explain to you at this point, is that we're predicting a, a message of, of Islam. And Islam is the third woe in our history. And the third woe comes from the seven trumpets of Revelation. And the seven trumpets of Revelation begin in chapter 8. And in chapter 8 of Revelation, you're going to have two symbols of, of falling stars, sort of. You're going to have the third trumpet being Attila the Hun. And Attila the Hun wasn't necessarily Muslim, but Attila the Hun, when we put him on our prophetic line, he lines up with an activity of Islam in our history. So at that level, Attila the Hun is a symbol of Islam here at the end of the world. But in Revelation 8, you also have the, the threefold division of Western Rome. And it's symbolized as the sun, the moon, and the stars. And Western Rome, that government was taken apart one piece at a time in history. And the stars represented the Senate. Uh, the, the sun was the Caesars, and the, the um, moon was the consuls. And dividing Western Rome up into three parts in Revelation 8 was the prophetic way to describe how Western Rome came to its conclusion. So what I'm saying here, if you're not following me, is in Revelation chapter 8, in the trumpets, you have the Senate of Western Rome being represented by stars, and the story is how these stars are removed. You also have Attila the Hun, who is a falling star. But then in Revelation 9, you have Muhammad, who is definitely a symbol of Islam, and he's described as a falling star. So... In the trumpets, which the third woe is part of a trumpet, you have those characteristics going into uh, consideration on November 12th about what might happen on November 13th that would have been typified by this happening. Okay, So what I'm saying is if anything happened on November 13th that was a fulfillment of this, first off, it would be something, not that everyone in the United States saw, they may see it, but they wouldn't think one way or another about it. It would be something that the priest would recognize, the priest would be held accountable for. Because this is the story of the priest at this point in time. This is the story of the internal raphia and paneum. Okay, so what happened on November 13th? Anything. Okay, well... Pardon me? He started the impeachment in the Congress. House. The impeachment proceedings began in the House of Representatives on November 13th, officially. 
And if you're serious about this message, and most of the people that used to be in this message that will still profess to be serious about this general message, most of them that have left for the new movement, if they were serious, even with their misguided understanding, they would admit that we came to understand and identify prophetically a long time ago that this country, based upon the writings of the spirit of prophecy, was going to have another civil war. And that the last president, the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump, would be the president that was in power when this civil war started. And in order to have a civil war, you have to develop two classes against each other, whether it would be black and white, or rich and poor, however you want to, want to frame it. If you're going to have a civil war, you have to have two sides. And we've been teaching for a long time that the two sides is not so much about race, it's not so much about wealth, it's about political persuasion. It's about the liberals and the conservatives. And the first step into this civil war in the United States took place on November 13th when the House of Representatives launched their impeachment inquiry and everyone knows it's totally political. It's totally political. They're not doing this because they really have any evidence of Trump having any high crimes and misdemeanors. This is about them attempting to overturn an election, which means they're attempting to overturn the very guiding principles of the Constitution. And it's over these issues that the civil war in the United States is going to begin. And at one level, it began on Wednesday with the House of Representatives beginning the impeachment process. At another level, in the White House, Donald Trump was meeting with the President of Turkey. Turkey being a symbol of Islam, Turkey being a symbol of the Ottoman Empire. And what was their discussions about? Their discussions was about Donald Trump did not want the, does not want the country of Turkey buying weapons from Russia. It wants to sell weapons to Russia. So the argument that Trump was having, and it was an argument. There was some Republican senators there that got involved with the discussion. And uh, Lindsey Graham, from what I can understand, got exceptionally obnoxious to the president of Turkey over these issues. It wasn't just a, a good old time. Wants to sell guns to Turkey, not to Russia. Thank you for the correction. The issue is, Donald Trump wants the Ottoman Empire, the president of Turkey, to buy our weapons of mass destruction, not to buy Russia's weapons of mass destruction. So Donald Trump was there using the art of the deal on November 13th in the White House. You've got to see it if you're in this movement. It was an argument between the king of the south and the king of the north. It was an argument about Putin and Trump. And the argument was with the president of the Ottoman Empire, the president of Turkey. These are the very subjects of our message, if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Happened on the very same day that the Senate, which lines up with the, not the Senate, happened on the very same day that the House of Representatives that lines up with the Senate of the Roman Empire, which was symbolized as stars, began its fall. It began to fall politically. It quit doing the work of the legislative branch and began doing a political work. The stars fell in the House of Representatives. And you can rest assured, even if they pass the impeachment vote when it goes to the Senate, the Senate ain't going to pass it. They haven't got the votes. They haven't even got close to the votes. To pass it. It's all political. The Senate fell, began its fall on November 13th, the very same day that the President of the United States is in a struggle between himself and Russia, with Turkey being the middleman in that struggle. But that's not all. That's not all. On that day, on the 12th, the day before, we began to look at Nashville, Tennessee. And you can see in your notes that the Tennessee Titans, it's a football team, right? Football. football team. They are in Nashville, Tennessee. And you can see their symbol here. Of a, it's, a, 
it's a falling ball of fire, all right? Sister White sees balls of fire hitting Nashville and the symbol of the Tennessee Titans, Titans being one of the first classes of missiles that the United States used to carry intercontinental ballistic nuclear weapons to other countries. There was a class called the Titan class. But Titan is also uh, a Greek god. And if you use Greek characters to spell out Titan in the Greek, the number value of tit Titan is 666. Titan is a symbol of Satan. And in this, um, what do you call this? This emblem, this, this mascot of the Tennessee Titans. You'll see three stars. Tennessee was the 16th state in the United States. And it counts itself as the third state after the first 13 states. Those three stars, that's their justification for being there. But we know, as students of prophecy, that a star is what? It's an angel. It's a messenger. If you have three messages, what are, what are they? They're the three angels' messages right there in this banner of the Tennessee Titans. And although this is a, a messed up T, it's a capital T, what is a T? It's a cross. Okay, so, so we're understanding, based upon where we started today, that Sister White sees a ball of fire hit Nashville, Tennessee. And you you got to ask yourself, why? Okay, so here's a quote, just so you're clear. If you've ever heard of Madison College, Madison College is the only, co is the only organization in Ellen White's life that she agreed to be a board member on. She was into it. She, she wanted to support Madison College. It was the blueprint for true education. It had a college, it had a health work, and they were supposed to work together. And she traveled there quite a bit, and she wrote a great deal about it. But just so you know what Madison College is, here's a quote from Manuscripts Releases, Volume 11. I wish to speak of some things presented before me concerning the establishment of the school and the sanitarium that is to be established near Nashville. Madison Institutions. Madison College is by Nashville, what? Nashville, Tennessee. So you have Madison College there. And what else do you have in Nashville, Tennessee? Next page. <clears throat> you have the Parthian Temple. You see a picture of it there um, with its, all, of, all of the pillars. You want to note the pillars because when Sister White sees these balls of fire taken down this city, one of the things that she's po pointed out to her that she emphasizes is these pillars. And what is the Parthian Temple? It comes from Athens, Greece, and it's a symbol of Greek education and wisdom. And inside that temple, if you go visit it in Nashville, Tennessee, you'll see this statue there. You see, how, you see how big that statue is? It's the statue of Athena. That's the biggest statue of Athena in the world. Um, and I'll read you about Athena. Athena, also referred to as Athene, is a very important goddess of many things. She is the goddess of wisdom, courage, inspiration, civilization, law, and justice, strategic warfare, Mathematics, strength, strategy, the arts, crafts, and skills. She is known most specifically for strate her strate strategic skill in warfare and is often portrayed as companion of heroes and as the patron goddess of heroic endeavor. Athens was born from Zeus after he experienced an enormous headache and she sprang fully grown and in armor from his forehead. The Parthian Temple in Nashville, Tennessee was built in, for the 1897 World's Fair and it's a symbol of Greek wisdom and Greek education. And inside it you have this statue of Athena, which is also a symbol of Greek wisdom and warfare. And this all came to light right here. So I've already had some input from people saying, well, I see Sister White's comment about cities getting wiped out, but Sister White speaks of the cities getting wiped out because of their sin, the escalating sin. She, she talks about Los Angeles and Chicago 
being destroyed because of their sin, and other cities, but she names them as well. But she doesn't put any fireballs with them. This is the one where you have the fireballs in Nashville. But my argument is, is, is someone looked the other day, Nashville is not high for crime and vice among the cities in the United States. It just isn't. It's, it's, there's, there's other cities in Tennessee that are much more dangerous than Nashville. You know, you, it's okay if you have to stay all night in Nashville, okay, but you don't want to stay all night in Memphis. <laughs> you know, unless you're staying by the police station. Nashville is not the high crime area that some other cities are. My argument is this. This isn't about... Nashville being punished is not about the escalating sin in that city. It's about the argument over true and false education, which is the very essence of the midnight cry message. True education is what the midnight cry message is based upon. Okay, there's Adventist authors that have laid that out for us, that the blueprint, the reason that the people of the United States would not accept the midnight cry message of the Millerite history is because they had rejected the message of true education. Okay, some of us don't understand the significance of education in God's plan, but it is the, the top of the plan. So in, in Memphis, you have both God's pattern for true education, Madison College, mean Nashville. Nashville. <laughs> I mean Nashville. In Nashville, you have both God's plan for true education with Madison College, and you have this temple, Parthian temple, with the Greek goddess Athena in it. And all this came to light right here. Amen. And what, what it was here in this history was a token of the coming judgment. Did the judgment come in that history? Yes, on October 22nd, 1844, the judgment began. We got a different kind of judgment coming here. And this is a, a token for who? For everyone in the United States? No, nope, it's a token for those people that are in the midst of the internal raffia and paneum crisis. And it isn't... It isn't a job description that, a, that a, a rational human being would choose to begin to teach that there is a city in the United States that's going to get nuked by Islam and I'm going to tell you what day it's on and I'm going to tell you what city it's at. That isn't a message that you choose to go out and give. But the Lord's making sure that those of us have followed along this narrower, narrower, narrower path to get to this point that what we're suggesting about what took place on November 13th as our token, it's in agreement with how we've always laid out our biblical prophetic understanding. Not just recently, but always. Historical events were set before the people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. Trump in the White House with the President of Turkey was a historical event. The impeachment beginning was a historical event. The fact that the Tennessee Titans are in Nashville and that this is their mascot, symbol, banner, whatever, and it has all of this prophetic implication connected to it. And, and I, 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 one, one person was initially struggling with it and I, my response to them was, well, you go, go ahead and do me a favor. What is this? This flag of the Tennessee Titans, do we call it a flag or a banner or what do we call it? A logo. Okay, you, here's the favor I ask him to do. You go get the logo from every football team in the United States and show me if any other logo has every characteristic that speaks to this history. I haven't looked at them. I don't know what they are, but I know they don't. There's no way. Okay, and what does Tennessee mean? The, the bend in the river. Because when you're at the midnight cry, there's always water, there's always a river. Tennessee is the bend in the river. It's the land of the bending river. Meeting place, winding river, river of the great bend. Meeting place, winding river, river of the great bend. Did you want to say something? I seen your hand. Come up to the colors. Pardon me? Come up to the colors. Come up to the colors. <laughs> The, the end sign says, don't go back, come up to the colors. Come up to this end sign. So, 
what I'm saying is that in this history here, we have Josiah's revival and reformation that began the day after the disappointment. A disappointment goes for seven days. On Sunday, tomorrow, now you're going to see the Lord resurrected, come back down and breathe upon His people. And they're going to begin to get more and more light. Um, and the other one was, what was the other one? That was the Passover. We've had the token. Um, oh, we haven't got to the other one. Okay, so nature of the attack. Did you give me an hour or did you give me an hour and a half? Oh, but I already said it was an hour. Okay. This information on page 13 has already been put in the record. But at this point, we need to go through it very quickly again. Okay. World War II, 1945. 45, 45th President of the United States. What's not on your notes here is that we came to understand when we began looking at Trump as the president that George Washington typified Trump. Abraham Lincoln typified Trump. Washington was the first president, Trump's the last. Abraham Lincoln was the first Republican president, he's the last Republican president. From there we began to see that Trump is the president in World War III, therefore the president of World War II, Franklin Roosevelt, and the president of World War I. Who was the president of World War I? Help me out here. Woodrow Wilson? Okay. That Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Delano Roosevelt would typify Trump. Once you had, uh, and you already had, we already had um, Ronald Reagan the first typifying Trump with the bringing down of the wall. But once you have two or three presidents typifying Trump, it means all the all the presidents are typifying Trump. But what we found, among other things, is that if he was the president during the Third World War that we had a triple application of prophecy that we could consider. And what we considered was, is the characteristics of the First World War, combined with the characteristics of the Second World War, would give us the characteristics of the Third World War. And we, we've, that's a matter of public record for probably three years, my guess. A long time we've been dealing with that. And then when Tess came along with her information, trying to say that it's all going to be an information war, Cold War, that kind of thought kind of disappeared. And we haven't went back to the triple application of prophecy much, but I want to remind you of something. A triple application of prophecy works this way. All the characteristics of the first fulfillment, combined with all the characteristics of the second fulfillment, will be fulfilled in the third and final fulfillment. Therefore, our justification for looking, looking at nuclear weapons in the Third World War it's based upon the Second World War, but that isn't it, brothers and sisters, because in the First World War, the weapon that was introduced then was chemical weapons. So it's not just nuclear weapons we're speaking about, it's all the weapons, the conventional weapons, the chemical weapons, the nuclear weapons, the probably biological weapons are going to happen in World War III. So we had already understood, before we thought anything about July 18th or Nashville, some of us had understood that nuclear weapons would have to be employed in order to fulfill a triple application of prophecy, which this movement is largely guided by a triple application of prophecy. So when you get to 1945, you're in the history of the 45th President of the United States, and we already understand that between the Midnight Cry and the Sunday Law, <clears throat> the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy, the United States, is going to go down, while the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy, the United Nations, is going to arise. And we understand that the United States is going to take control of the United Nations as the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy gets put in place. And you guys are getting kind of heavy eyes out there. I can't allow that to happen. Okay. So you've got a transition going on from the Midnight Cry to the Sunday Law between Trump to the United Nations. And it's the Third World War time period. You should expect to see all the weapons of the First and Second World War in that time period. And when we go back and look at the Second World War, this is what has been discovered. The Potsdam Declaration, and both Odilio and Stephen have dealt with this already. Um, it was rejected on July 27, 1945. Here is the line of 
Josiah Litch. All right? July 27th, July 27th, July 27th, July 27th, July 27th. Okay? This is Ju Julian Gregorian, Julian, Julian Gregorian, but it's still July 27th. The chances of that happening at these waymarks are pretty small, pretty small, but this July 27th is also the 26th day of the fourth month, 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 26th day of the fourth month. That's impossible. I mean, it's not impossible. I know the people that calculate math will tell you that the, the probability is almost, uh, you don't have enough room to put the numbers of the probability. But July 27th is a symbol. And it's in this history. What's it a symbol of? Islam. 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 So, on July 27, 1945, Japan rejects the warning of the Potsdam Declaration saying you either surrender right now or you're going to get hit with a weapon that you cannot believe how horrible it's going to be. And Japan rejects that opportunity to save those lives. And on August 6th, which is the 26th day of the fourth month, it's the what? It's the 26th day of the fourth month, 26th day of the fourth month, 26th day of the fourth month, 26th day of the fourth month. It's the 26th day of the fourth month, August 6, 1945, that Hiroshima is hit with the first of two bombs, and it was dropped at 8.15. 8.15? That's August 15th, 1844. It's the midnight cry message at Exeter camp meeting. Three days later, they were going to drop a bomb on Kokura. You'll see that under Nagasaki, but it was cloud cover prevented them from doing it. I think I have my facts straight. So they chose the other target of Nagasaki, and they dropped it on August 9th, 1945, which on the Julian calendar is July 27th, July 27th, July 27th, July 27th, July 27th. You following me? There's those aren't coincidences. Okay, they're just not coincidences. The, the second target was moved to the third, never, never accomplished. If, it, if they would have had a third strike, if, there had, if they had had a third bomb and there had been no cloud cover, when do you suppose the third strike was going to be? On August 11th, right here. August 11th, 1840. 1945, but you're getting my point. August 11th. Every one of these is a symbol of Islam. You follow me? And after those two bombs, Japan surrendered when? On August 15th. What's August 15th? It's the Exeter camp meeting. It's the midnight cry. The time span from the first bomb on July 18th, uh, from, on Hiroshima, from August 6th, 1945, to July 18th, 2020, is 3,910 3, weeks and five days. It's the 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5. 391.5
wormwood. And a third part of the waters became Chernobyl, wormwood, a doubling. In verse 11 of Revelation 8, August 11th, 1840, symbol of Islam. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Cher Chernobyl happened on April 26th, 1986, the 26th day of the fourth month, Gregorian, July 18th, 2020, on the biblical and rabbinical calendar. July 18th, 2020, is Chernobyl in 1984, All of this is already in these recent studies by Stephen and Odilio. But it's saying this before we move on. Where I started today was this. In this history here, the Lord has to raise up an ensign in order to bring in the Levites. And it's not simply bring, raising up a group of people that have the perfect character of Christ. It's raising up that group of people that have a message. But this message is proclaimed in the context of Elijah. The story of Elijah is playing out here, starting on November 9th. Well, starting even before, but on November 9th, the prophecy that the new movement put in place with many predictions fell apart. Their predictions didn't come true. They're going to have to keep their flock in line, so they're going to have to give explanations on what really happened according to them, and they're going to have to escalate their activities to defend their message, but that was their message, was November 9th. Our message like Elijah's message, comes after their message. This is the story of Elijah. That's why the, the scripture reading for the last presentation is in 1 Kings 18, verses 37 to 39. Because in verse 37 you have a doubling, and in verse 39 you have a doubling. And it's talking about this very event Right here, the midnight cry, Paneum. And in verse 38 of 1 Kings 18, that's where the fire comes down out of heaven upon Elijah's offering. Our offering is July 18th, 2020. The new movement's offering was November 9th, 2019. They're now dancing around their offering, getting ready to slash and cut themselves with an emotional experience to keep their minions in place and we're getting ready to take the field of action and in this history when we do something's going to have to happen that lifts this argument between them and us into the public to where it's more than just the few thousand people that are looking at this around the world what do you suppose is going to do that? I think part of what's going to do it is this message. This message is going to get somebody in trouble. It's going to get, get him in trouble with the Adventist church and probably going to get him in trouble with the laws of the land. Because when Christ got in trouble, he got in trouble uh, supposedly for blaspheming the church but for sedition against the government. And for someone in, the, in the, the state of affairs of this political world right now to be saying that Islam is going to strike a city in the United States at this date with a nuclear weapon, that's probably... It's probably going to... You, we're about to be labeled as a, a bunch of wide-eyed fanatics, Okay? These people are crazy, so crazy that you need to restrain them because they might do something really radical. Now, why am I saying that? Well, I'm saying that because go to 1 Kings 18, where I was just referring to. Verse 37 is the doubling. Hear me, O Lord, hear me. 
that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. What people are supposed to hear him? The Levites. Forget the prophets of Baal. They're old news. Then verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. That's this, brothers and sisters. That's this right here. July 18th, 2020. That's our offering coming to pass. And verse 39 says, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The Levites see who, whose God is God now. But the reason I went there to read that is because I raised the question. They're going to call us a bunch of wild-eyed fanatics. Maybe the level of fanaticism that they have to restrain us. Our main, one of our main understandings is that Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. There's a few times that happened in Millerite history, but there's one that time it happened in 1838, and this is First Kings 1838. Is it not? This is the message of Josiah Litch. And for two years, everyone said, this guy is an idiot. These people are a bunch of fools. But, when the fire came down on August 11th, 1840, and confirmed that prediction, 200,000 people joined the Advent movement. Who are those people? They're the Levites. How can you get away from this? How can you not preach this? I wish I didn't have to preach this. All right? But how could you do anything but preach this? First off, because you can see the Lord's developed this. Wasn't any human development. First, second off, you can tell it's the same way he's taught for the last 30 years. But third off, we'll read some quotes on third off. How could we possibly not teach this when there's a whole city that's about to get wiped off the map? Page 15. Now this isn't about the fireballs. This is just about basic responsibility to light. Testimonies, Volume 9. 19 and 20. Christ says of his people, you are the light of the world. It is not a small matter that the counsels and plans of God have been so clearly opened to us. It is a wonderful privilege to be able to understand the will of God as revealed in the sure word of prophecy. This places on us a heavy responsibility. God expects us to impart to others the knowledge that he has given us. It is His purpose that divine and human instrumentalities shall unite in the proclamation of the warning message. So far as His opportunities extend, everyone who has received the light of truth is under the same responsibility as was the prophet of Israel, to whom came the word, Son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Of what value will our words be then? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressors before we tell Him how to avoid them? Where is our faith in the Word of God? Must we see the things foretold come to pass before we will believe what He has said? In clear, distinct rays, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is near at hand, even at the doors. Let us read and understand before it is too late. 
So I want to put in here one more thought, one more time. Part of what I'm trying to put in place today with last presentation, this one, is the responsibility, the requirement, if you're going to be part of the ensign, is that you not only have to have a life that agrees with the message that you're proclaiming, but that you have to proclaim a warning message, the, the warning message that is given to you. And this is a warning message that's not only a hard, severe warning message, it's a warning message that's, that's set in the context of the faith of Abraham, the father of faith. That in order to, to stand upon this message, you have to understand that you're placing time into the prophetic record in spite of what you were educated when you came into Adventism from the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. You have to be so familiar with God's voice that you can understand that His voice now is telling you to do this very thing. And you can rest assured that Satan's going to be tempting you all along the way, the way he tempted Abraham to disbelieve what God had told him to do when God told him to sacrifice his son, when Abraham knew full well that God had told him, Thou shalt not kill. So let's look at some of these few passages on Nashville. In the spirit of prophecy, she's the one that identifies the place. And it's all in the context, not, it's not all, but I want you to look at it in the context of the parable of the ten virgins. Matthew 25, verse 6 says, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. We're in midnight. If there's anything that we learn from Millerite history with Samuel Snow, is he gave the message midway. He gave it at midnight in Boston. He gave it again in Concord. He gave it again in Exeter. All of those were the midnight cry. Midnight is a period of time. We're in midnight now. We've been in midnight since November 9th. The cry is the message. Manuscript 102, 1904. Last night, see the night? Midnight. Last night, a scene was presented before me. I may never feel, I may never feel free to reveal all of it, but I will reveal a little. It seemed that an immense ball of fire came down upon the world and crushed the large houses. Funny that the emblem of the Tennessee Titans is a ball of fire. From place to place rose the cry. The cry? The Lord has come, the Lord has come. Doubling. Many were unprepared to meet Him. Go you out to meet Him. But a few were saying, Praise the Lord. Why are you praising the Lord? inquired those upon whom was coming sudden destruction. Now, if you're familiar with Sister White's comments on the parable of the ten virgins, there's a classic place where she says of the parable of the ten virgins, something sudden and expected, unexpected will come up Yeah, yes. And bring the soul face to face with death. Something sudden, sudden and expect, unexpected. A sudden and un unlooked for calamity will bring the soul face to face with death. That's this principle here. Why are you praising the Lord, inquired those upon whom was coming sudden destruction? Because we now see what we've been looking for. There's people that knew about it. If you believe that these things were coming, why did you not tell us? Was the terrible response. We did not know about these things. Why did you leave us in ignorance? Again and again, there's a doubling. You have seen us. Why did you not become acquainted with us and tell us of the judgment to come that we must serve God lest we perish? Now we are lost. Okay. I hope you're getting my point. My point is, is that if you're going to be the ensign, you have a warning message to give to Nashville before the event because the story about the fireballs in Nashville always includes this scenario that they were to be warned before it arrived. I wanted to point out that this is actually something that doesn't actually happen because if it did, these people would not be able to stand there and say anything that the ball came down it would engulf them, their eyes would melt. So how do you describe that? Yeah, I, we get that. We, yeah. I, I get it. Yeah. I, I think 
what, what the sister said, if you haven't heard it, is that Sister White is describing a reaction to an event that if they had actually been there and the whole city was disintegrated, they couldn't have been arguing with people about who did or didn't give them the warning. So this is a, a warning. it's a warning about circumstances surrounding this event that is definitely going to happen because God's word never fails. Okay. Um, so see this as when people say, if you believe these things were coming, why did you not tell us? This can easily be seen as people that were not there. You could have had loved ones, just anybody, the government, anybody that would say that. You knew this and you didn't tell us? Okay, that way too. But either way, the next paragraph says, every church member is to train the intellect. Notice what she's going to say about this. In order that he may gain a clear understanding of the will of God concerning him, everyone is to educate the voice that he may communicate a knowledge of the scriptures to those who are in ignorance. May God help us to stand like Daniel in our lot and place during the days of probation that remain. Okay, next quote. She's emphasizing our responsibility to give a warning message. That's what I want you to see. Next quote, manuscript 152, 1904. There was a scene presented to me. It was the night before the Sabbath. Nighttime once again. Friday night. That is when the scene was presented. She really wants us to know that. She tells us and then she repeats it. That is when the scene was presented. When does... When does July 18th fall? July 18th is the Sabbath. Okay. So... She's emphasizing that she's getting this vision on a Friday night, but we know that July 18, 2020 is on the Sabbath. But when does the Sabbath begin? <laughs> Friday night, okay? Just making sure everyone has that locked in. It was the night before Sabbath. That is when the scene was presented. I looked out of the window and there was an immense ball of fire that had come from heaven and it fell where they were casting buildings with pillars. Especially the pillars were presented to me. And it seemed as if a ball came right to the building and crushed it. And they saw that it was branching out, branching out. There's a doubling. Enlarging. You ever seen the pictures of an atomic blast? It goes, it makes the mushroom cloud like a tree, like an ash tree. But the, it, it keeps spreading out along the, the not the horizon, the ground level. It just keeps going out. Okay, Branching out, branching out. Enlarging, and they begin to cry. There's the midnight cry, and mourn and mourn, a doubling, and wring their hands. And I thought some of our people stood by there saying, Well, it's just what we've been expecting. It's just what we've been talking about. It is just what we've been talking about. There's a doubling for you. You knew it, said the people. You knew it. There's a doubling for you. And never told us about it. I thought there was such an agony in their face, such an agony in their appearance. There's a doubling, such an agony, such an agony. You seen how the doublings in there? In the next scene, I was in a room. And that's, she's switching the scene here. It, it don't, she's going to talk about a different kind of light here. In the next scene, I was. The next scene, I was a room. In the next scene, I was. I must be in a room where there was a company sitting around as we are here, and there was one of authorities that stood there and he had maps and he took the map and he put it in the, the hands of one and had him look at it. There were little fine rays of light coming, light from heaven that seemed to be coming down and they were all prepared to absorb the whole vicinity around. It seemed as if the light was going to be given to the whole vicinity around and then that was struck right out and the light was struck out. Now she, this isn't a bad light. This is the truth coming down that was supposed to spread across the land. She switched total, switched total gears here. She's now talking about giving a message and she's saying she's looking at this map of the, God's message going across the world and then the, the light is just struck out. It's struck out. That was struck right out. The light was struck out. There was not a message of warning given to that city that ought to have been given years ago and then that city, he pointed out, and another city, and another city that ought to have had the light of life in this southern field. That light seemed cut right off, cut right away and in darkness and now the words were, 
It will be very difficult, a much more difficult matter to reach things now because the enemy has been getting advance all these years. That is what was repeated all these years. Now, said he, when you consider your neighbor, who is my neighbor? Put every exercise of your body and mind to work. If you cannot go yourself, keep your foot off the brake. Don't put your foot on the brake and hold it so that the carriage cannot move, that the work cannot go. Well, he presented it in such a way as that. Now the light was all ready to come right from heaven on these cities, just as was presented in that first map. But the faith was far weaker than the strength of unbelief, and yet that unbelief, not merely in one man, but in others, had not only prevented the work, but it was to prevent and hinder work all these years. With their talking discouragement and with their grabbing hold of everything objectionable they saw that could be, make a point on back of all these was that when the light was presented that the south was to be worked, when the means was sent in to do that, because the word color was not put in, the means was just deferred right on to other channels. So, she's talking about a responsibility to carry a message for the second time we've seen this in context with these fireballs. It's about not only the, the prophetic reality, but the responsibility of you and I to share this message in advance of the event, even though we know from the history of Josiah Litch this isn't going to be any fun. Manuscript 154, 1904. We're almost done. Tell the people that the Lord is coming and you want them to be prepared for His coming. We can see the signs of His advent everywhere. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As we see the record of unholy marriages and divorces, can we not see that society is rapidly becoming as it was in the days before the flood? Then let us urge the people to seek the Lord while He may be found, that He may not come and find them unprepared. With one touch of the finger of God, the greatest buildings that can be erected will fall as kindling wood. We've seen this in Baltimore, and we shall see it in many other places. These things are the voice of God, speaking to us that He is God, and that He has all the powers of heaven at His command. If we go on unheeding, indifferent, and careless, His judgments will fall upon us. Shall we, with the greatest truth that has ever been given to mortals, be satisfied with the feeble efforts that are now being put forth to warn the world? We see a few tents pitched, a few ministers at work in various places, but where's the church? Where are the households? Do they realize that they are to take hold of God by a living faith and do everything in their power to let the light shine to others? While I was in Nashville, a scene was opened before me. A great ball of fire seemed to fall from heaven and from it went forth flashes of light. When these flames of light would strike a building, the building would burn like tinder. And then I heard someone say, I knew that this was coming. These, judgment, these are the judgments of God, and I knew they knew were coming. You knew, said another. You were my neighbor. Why did you not tell me that these things were coming? Why did you not warn others? Just talking about Nashville again, emphasizing our responsibility to give a warning in advance of the event. Manuscript 158, 1904. The Lord is com soon coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. His terrible judgments are soon to fall upon our world. Are we doing all we can to warn earth's inhabitants of these things? While I was in the south a few months ago, I had a very impressive dream. I seemed to see a great ball of fire come from heaven and strike the earth. Great houses were in flames and many were looking on in great distress. Someone said, I knew that this was coming. I knew that God's judgments were soon to call. Fall. You knew that these things were coming, said another. Why did you not tell us? Why did you not warn us and show us these prophecies that we might all so know? Letter 1904. Letter 217, 1904. Prophecies, yes. And we're almost done. Oh, no. I turned two pages instead of one. At this time, money is greatly needed in the work of the Lord. God calls upon His people to place their means in the bank of heaven beside His throne. Do not allow your means to be buried up now where there is, no, there is so much need of it in the Lord's work. And if you know of others who have money to spare, ask them to place it in the bank of heaven. The Lord will bless them in helping to get the truth before those who know it not. 
The night before last, a very impressive dream scene passed before me. I saw an immense ball of fire fall into the midst of some beautiful mansions, causing their instant destruction. I heard some say, We knew the judgments of God were coming on the earth, but we did not know they would come so soon. Others said, You knew? Why then did you not tell us why we did not know? On every side I heard such words spoken. In great distress I awoke. I went to sleep again and seemed to be in a great gathering. One in authority was dressing a company by whom one was spread a map of the world. He said that the map pictured God's vineyard, which was to be cultivated. As light from heaven shone upon any soul, that soul was to reflect the light to others. Lights were to be kindled in many places, and from these lights still other lights were to be tingled, kindled. The words were repeated. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have, have lost its, his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and, give, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Then I saw jets of light shining from cities and villages and from the high places and the low places of the earth. God's word was obeyed, and as a result there were memorials for him in every city and village. His truth was proclaimed throughout the world. Then this map was removed, and another put in its place. There were streaks of light from heaven in a few places. The rest of the world was dark as midnight, with only a glimmer of light here and there. Our instructor said, This darkness is the result of men following their own counsel. They have cherished hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil. They have made questioning and fault-finding and accusing the chief business of their lives. Their hearts are not right with God. They have hidden their light under a bushel. In the southern field, where there should be bright beams of light, there is much darkness. I read this as the opening statement. This is the quote where she says it hits Nashville. Manuscript 188, 1905. When I was at Nashville... I had been speaking to the people, and in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from the ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. Some of the people were standing there. It's just as we expected. So, in my next presentation, I'm going to go back to this history here and begin to develop a thought that I put in place, this thought over here, that from 782 to 1299, we can see two different lines teaching the same thing in reverse. We can see a history of 126 years, it takes us to 908, followed by 391 years, it takes us to 1299. Or we can see a history that goes 391 years and takes us to 1173, followed by 126 years. We're going to go over to this history and begin to identify that from no November 9th, maybe even back here on September 7th, from, from November 9th onward, that there are several lines of truth going here. And after Stephen's presentation on Monday, you will see some of those other lines of truth. And at first glance, they will seem confusing. But the reality of it is, is they're bringing things into perfect order. And I'm, I, my argument is, is that as of now, the seven days of, of disappointment, whatever that represents, the seven days we've been in the ark without any rain, the seven prayers we've had, uh, praying for rain, um, they're over, and that the Lord is going in, in agreement with the fact that we're in Ezekiel 1.1 after 30 years. The Lord is about to open the most holy place in terms of our prophetic light, and He's going to bring these truths into a perfect order where we can have the kind of confidence in the message that we need to have in order to stand before an entire world, an entire country, and give the most absurd message that this country has ever heard. But it's going to be a true message. And it's going to come to pass. 
It's going to make a distinction between the new movement and the old movement. It's going to bring the Levites in. The Levites are going to come stand with us. And we're going to give a message then to the rest of the world about December 25th, 2021, which will be just as absurd. But by that time, the Nethanims are going to be listened real closely because the old saying around planet Earth is when the United States sneezes, the world gets a cold. And when you strike the United States with a nuclear bomb, it's going to cause some problems. And the whole world is going to be looking at the United States. And the image of the beast testing time will be underway. And those people that have proved faithful and are in that history of the image of the beast testing time, being led by the Lord, are going to become public outcasts, but they're also going to become an ensign for the 11th hour workers and the Lord's going to be faithful with them and to them and lead them through that crisis as He determines all the way to the Sunday law. And I'm here to tell you that if you've been in an Adventist as long as I have or, or close to it, that you should have known that at some point in time the message of Adventism was going to become present truth. And the message of Adventism is that you're a Seventh-day Adventist, therefore you believe in the Lord's second coming. It's about to happen. And you're a Seventh-day Adventist, so you understand the testing issue is going to be Sabbath and Sunday. We're here. That's about to take place. We have things in prophecy that have not been clarified for us yet. But we can see the Lord clarifying so many things that I'm not too concerned about what I don't understand at this point. Because I know the line of the tribe of Judah has been faithful for 30 years to open the truth right at the right time as he needed to. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light that you have opened up in this, this desolate little ministry here in Arkansas over the past month or so. A ministry that used to be full of people in this auditorium. Now it's just full of the people you've chosen to be here. But it's amazing the light that you've been bringing to the surface in, in spite of the great trials that have been experienced here across the board. We thank you that you accounted us worthy to be involved with this purification process, be involved with handling such sacred truths. And we ask that you'd continue to pour your light out upon us uh, as you see fit and that you would um, continue to uh, promote this message around planet Earth that those that will be warned can be warned before their probation close. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.